Hi, I'm Mark Church. I'm a product manager for Google Cloud, but my container journey started six years ago when I worked at Docker. I was fortunate enough to get a front row seat in watching the evolution of modern containers unfold. And from containers running on individual hosts to orchestrated containers across hosts to multi-data center, multi-cloud container deployments, we've seen the world change a lot over the last six years, thanks to innovations largely coming out of open source software. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Nginx is no stranger to open source. And in fact, it's one of the first containers I deployed was an Nginx container, Docker run Nginx-P, I think. And then you could go to your local host and you could see Nginx running. So in 2015, that was absolutely amazing and it opened up my eyes to the world and showed me where things were going. So here we are six years and one pandemic later, and we've, we've gone way past individual containers and Kubernetes has really taken over the ecosystem in the world. So let's look at the proliferation of Kubernetes containers and how much it's growing. So this is the latest CNCF survey data that shows in early 2016, 23% of companies were running Kubernetes in production, all the way to 2020, in which 92% of companies are or are about to run Kubernetes in production. So in this short amount of time, we've seen containers and Kubernetes go from a hacky science project to being run in production at almost every major company in the world. First, it was in isolated teams and startups. They fully owned their Kubernetes environment and nobody in the company really understood what they were doing. Then came the mega scale web companies, Spotify, Shopify, Booking.com, and so on. And this was a turning point because it showed how an entire company made of many different independent teams using different languages and technologies could standardize all of these teams on Kubernetes. You got entire companies running 98% of their applications on Kubernetes. And so the traditional companies began to take notice and we saw banking, oil and gas and manufacturing start using it. And now Kubernetes is even going to space. Last week, there was an announcement from Hypergiant that they're embedding Kubernetes clusters into satellites and sending them into space. Kubernetes is expanding at the edge of space and also to the edge of the internet as cloud providers and telcos place Kubernetes clusters even closer to users for things like 5G and retail. So the thing that happened was that Kubernetes has expanded to all these areas and it's we slowly built a uniform software deployment layer. I can deploy the same Kubernetes app across different cloud providers or on-prem or even satellites more easily than I ever could before. And so this is, this is important because it's changing how companies are delivering software. Splunk, for instance, has an operator for Kubernetes. And of course, our beloved Nginx Ingress controller also deploys consistently wherever Kubernetes is. Kubernetes is becoming a way into which to deliver your software to your customers. And so more importantly, how and why did Kubernetes expand to so many places so quickly? Why is it so popular? Is it because it deploys containers? Well, yes, kind of. If all Kubernetes did was launch and orchestrate containers, it would still be incredibly valuable. But a couple other things did this as well. There was Swarm, Mesos, Docker Compose. Some of these existed before Kubernetes. So it could have been that alone. Is it because it standardizes many sysadmin tasks within a single platform? Yes, this is definitely part of it. Health checking, auto scaling, process management, restarts, all these things could become consistent within a Kubernetes platform, things that were bash scripts before. But at the same time, other things did this too. Heroku, Google App Engine, other app and infra platforms existed. So what was different? Is it because Kubernetes provided a declarative and distributed infrastructure programming? Yes, also kind of. So this merged developer workflows with sysadmin workflows Configuration for infrastructure was checked into Git, everything was versioned, and it was deployed just like a programming language could be written and deployed. But Kubernetes wasn't also the only thing that did that. We had Puppet, we had Chef, we had Ansible, we had Terraform. We had lots of tools that could do this before Kubernetes did. So is it because of Kubernetes extensible API model? Yes, this definitely played a role as well. Kubernetes had core resource types like pods and ingress and secrets but it also allowed new custom resources to exist to be created by anybody and annotated. So really at the end of the day, there was no single innovation that made Kubernetes a successful technology. Like most entrepreneurs will say, it was a combination of good ideas, 
Good luck and timing. Individually, Kubernetes didn't do anything that had never been done before but it was the combination of container management, standardized ops processes, declarative API, and a high degree of extensibility all in one package, uh, which are things that had never come together before. And so the rest is really history. Everybody knows also that software is never done and Kubernetes is, is no different. So Kubernetes is constantly evolving, growing, even deprecating older parts. And while the maturity of the project has allowed even the most conservative companies to start adopting it, there's still rapid iteration innovation happening in many, project, in many parts of the project. This is mostly because of the extensibility of Kubernetes, which has allowed it to, to continue growing without impacting the core functionality of the project. For example, Kubernetes enhancement proposals. It's open source at its finest. It allows anybody in the world to propose a new capability for Kubernetes that goes through a formal process of consideration, design, and approval. And thanks to custom resource definitions or CRDs, anybody can create a Kubernetes controller which is configured just like a core resource is. Now, this has really created a vast ecosystem of Kubernetes oriented companies who are extending it with additional functionality, whether it's CI CD pipelines, compliance analysis, database orchestration, or ingress. There are tools and products that plug right into any Kubernetes compliant uh, cluster. The unfortunate thing is that new Kubernetes users look at this and it scares them. Rightly so. Many have said that Kubernetes is too complicated, and it is complicated. Kubernetes solves a lot of problems, and it also introduces new ones. And so I've heard this quote before, that Kubernetes is both the problem and the solution. People often say that when they complain about the complexity, but it's really true of, to all technologies to a degree. We never had car accidents or traffic jams before we had cars. And while I've lost complete control of my email inbox, I can't imagine doing my job on a typewriter. So there's a better way to phrase this complexity that we're all experiencing. And it's really that technology solves the problems of today and it creates the problems of tomorrow. With every generation, we are creating tech to solve our issues and creating new issues that we could have never imagined that could have existed. Who could have anticipated that our refrigerators can get infected with malware, join a botnet, and coordinate with other refrigerators to take down the internet? But in 2016, this exact thing happened, and it took down many of the websites you use every day. Technology is always solving problems and also introducing new ones. So let's look at the generations of technologies that existed before Kubernetes. Each generation solved problems from the previous generation and created new problems for the next one. Virtual machines made it easier to spin up operating systems and apps, but it created software sprawl that was difficult to manage at scale. Containers helped us adapt uh, or update and deploy software more easily and frequently because of immutability. So this solved some of our software delivery challenges, but it created even more sprawl. Companies have 20 times as many containers as they had VMs, and these container lifetimes are several orders of magnitude shorter. So we needed new technologies to orchestrate this mess that we created. And that's where Kubernetes and other container orchestration systems came along. So containers and Kubernetes really enabled us to use microservices. The scope of software ownership and deployment became smaller and more granular. This reduced costly dependencies between components, but it also created an explosion of different communicating components. There was a greater urgency than ever for us in the industry to observe, control, and secure communication between all of these different components. And that's where the generational leap to service mesh plays a role. Would service mesh have come about without Kubernetes and containers? Absolutely. Things resembling service meshes already existed for some time long before containers were around. However, on one hand, the ability for Kubernetes to automatically inject a sidecar into a pod enabled service mesh. So really Kubernetes made it easier to use a service mesh. And at the same time, the scale of microservices and the complexity that Kubernetes really enabled also created a much bigger demand for things like service mesh. So one generation of tech not only enabled the next generation, it also introduced new problems that created a demand for the next generation. So how is service mesh changing our networks? Well, let's look at the following architectures. The first two are models that you've surely seen before. In the first, every team owns their proxy and controls how traffic is load balanced to their application. The proxy might even be built directly into the app. So networking and ownership and architecture is distributed. 
Now, every single layer could do networking differently. And so you have a combinatorial explosion of complexity in terms of how different things communicate, how they decide to. So let's say then you decide to centralize everything. So now you have one team that owns the load balancing layer and you can enforce security, observability, and routing all in one location. It's somewhat of an inefficient traffic path, sure, but what's worse is that every team has to interact with your proxy team. And this creates organizational silos that slows things down. Developers are no longer empowered. And so what a service mesh allows you to do is to have a decentralized architecture, right? So then different apps can do what they need to do and have ownership of those things while still centralizing the ownership and control of the networking layer. It empowers teams to control networking and communication, but in a standardized way. Similar to how Kubernetes standardized sysadmin workflows, Service Mesh standardizes communication. And so when Service Mesh first came on the scene, everybody acted like it was going to solve all the problems. We were deep in the hype cycle. And Service Mesh was kind of just specific to containers, but left out a lot of other workloads. So just like containers, early on, we saw Service Mesh practitioners running them at startups, and at web companies that had purely cloud native tech stacks. And there's another company that reminds me of this trend and it was Slack. When, first, when people first started using Slack, they all said email was dead. In fact, I worked at companies where no one even answered email. The email SLA was five business days to never. But an interesting thing happened as Slack matured. Slack started integrating with email. It was actually, it's, it's pretty cool. So you, for example, could have a, a public mailer, that's your support line, and customers can email it and that email gets diverted to your support team Slack channel. So people stopped saying that email was dead. All of a sudden, it made sense to have these two modalities of communication integrated. Service mesh and containers are having their email moment. The world of containers, VMs, load balancers, API gateways, cloud, on-prem, service meshes, they're all integrating. New technology is merging with existing technology, and it's making us realize that the two were never really all that different to begin with. When an email is forwarded to a Slack channel, it gives you the same content. It's just presented and searchable in a slightly different way. Similarly, the ways that we're interacting with load balancing is changing and aligning with the dynamic declarative and distributed characteristics of Kubernetes, but we're still just load balancing. So let's talk about three predictions about the future of service mesh and containers. And just one caveat, most of these predictions are already happening in one area or another, so I wouldn't exactly call them pr true predictions, more observations. So prediction number one, VMs, containers, and serverless are a spectrum of compute and Service Mesh will expand to provide consistent communication layer across this entire spectrum. So here's why. All compute must communicate, uh, and apps are deployed these days with different components even being across these compute modalities. As a result, there's a need for consistent communication layer across them, i.e. a Service Mesh. And so we're already seeing this happen to a degree. VMs in containers are very common to be interacting together within the same application, and serverless is becoming even more so as well. Prediction number two, API gateways, load balancers, and service meshes will continue to look more similar to each other. So here's why. If you look at this picture, we see a service mesh on the left-hand side running inside pods of a Kubernetes cluster. Really, this, the boundaries of what's considered a service mesh are expanding. So now they're being run across multiple Kubernetes clusters, multiple cloud regions and data centers, on-premise apps, VMs, and so on. And so as the mesh boundary expands, the concepts of north, south, east, and west are becoming blurry. Zero trust, authentication, rate limiting, other features that are characteristics of strong service boundaries are increasingly existing inside the mesh. So as a result, we're seeing more API gateway capabilities inside the mesh itself. Prediction number three, the gap between Kubernetes networking and service mesh will shrink and become an incremental step. Now, I don't see Kubernetes itself becoming a sidecar proxy control plane. The world of service mesh is innovating rapidly and so choice and pluggability are still very important at this layer. However, convergence will make it easier to run service mesh on top of Kubernetes as two much more complementary technologies. It's not a small undertaking to start using a service mesh. And as an industry, we should be pushing towards making service mesh adoption incremental. While service mesh offers traffic control, observability, and security, 
Maybe only one of those things are important to you right now. It should be easy to enable just that capability on Kubernetes without having to significantly change your architecture. So this last prediction brings me to a topic that I'm deeply involved in, which is the evolution of Kubernetes networking APIs. It all started with one beloved Kubernetes resource type, the ingress resource, that I'm sure as Nginx users, you've all heard of and probably use it to configure Nginx in your Kubernetes cluster. So ingress is a standard Kubernetes resource that models layer seven load balancing as an industry standard API. It allows you to configure host path routing and TLS. And it's been a massive success story with many vendors supporting it in a large ecosystem of ingress controllers. The standardization has also made load balancing more accessible and developer driven than ever. So ingress has done great things for the industry, but as Kubernetes networking and service mesh have grown significantly, we also have to grow the standards that we use to deploy them. Ingress in some ways is the lowest common denominator with a majority of load balancing functionality undefined by the spec. So vendors like Nginx have had to add annotations and custom resources to augment ingress to support these, these capabilities. It also doesn't provide any first-class forms of multi-tenancy, and it only addresses north-south ingress traffic. This all hurts portability and reduces simplicity for users. All the while, the emergence of service mesh has created functionality outside the domain of ingress with no portability or industry standard mechanisms for configuring them. So this is where I wanna talk about how the Kubernetes community is addressing these gaps. I'd like to introduce the Kubernetes Gateway API, an open source interface that is the evolution of ingress and the standardization of APIs to be used for the next generation of service networking. It's not an implementation on its own, but rather an API standard that the ecosystem of vendors conforms to that helps us create portability. So at KubeCon in 2019 in San Diego, this new spec called the Gateway API was proposed, which, defined, which was defined by the lessons the Kubernetes learned from both ingress and service mesh. It's designed to be a modern resource for configuring load balancing and routing in Kubernetes, not specific to north, south, or east, west, but rather all kinds of traffic inside, to, and from Kubernetes clusters. It's designed with expressiveness. It has more capabilities that are core in the API, like weighted traffic splitting, header-based routing manipulation, traffic mirroring rewrites, and so on. It has extensibility, so it's easier for vendors to extend their custom functionality on top of the core resources without having to switch to an entirely new API. It's also role-oriented. Role it's an API designed for the roles that configure and use load balancing. So in a startup, there might just be one person responsible for configuring load balancing in Kubernetes. But in a larger organization, there might be two or three tiers of ownership. And it's important that we have an API that conforms to the levels of ownership that exist and provides every single level a Kubernetes native API that they can use for a self-service interface. And that's exactly what the Gateway API does. By breaking apart the ingress resource into route resources and gateway resources, we're giving the infrastructure administrators and the service owners the exact configuration and the capabilities that they need for their roles. And now that we have an API that supports routing for ingress, mesh, and egress, this makes the adoption of service mesh a little more incremental. The concepts and APIs that you use to configure ingress are consistent with mesh. And this being an industry standard lowers the barrier of adoption since concepts, terminology, and a large part of the a large part of the functionality is transferable across implementation. So building on Rob's announcement to support the community Nginx controller, I'd also like to announce that Nginx is joining the Gateway API community and will be lending their experience and history in this industry to help us evolve the standard. Nginx is also committed to implementing their own gateway controller based on Nginx. Given how pervasive Nginx use is in Kubernetes, this is a great step for the Kubernetes community. I'm really excited about what will come from it, and we hope you are as well. Thank you.